Uh, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I said the wrong thing. No, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that's a slightly premature start. There may be more people arriving. So, as I say, um, I do bear with them if they do, because there's other sessions just finishing. Um, we're here to talk about uh, broadcasting and Scotland, and in particular, broadcasting in an independent Scotland. There are a host of issues. Uh, the health and welfare of creative Scotland, uh, the contribution that Scotland makes to the UK, the contribution that Scotland makes to broadcasting the world over, how Scotland is seen, how Scotland sees itself, and it's, I won't need to tell this audience this, I'm sure, it's transparently evident that uh, in any nation, broadcasting has a unique uh, cultural and industrial position. Uh, and we couldn't be better placed. Uh, looking forward towards uh, independence uh, or the campaign for independence, the prospective referendum on independence, the issues couldn't be sharper. And here we are in Edinburgh for once, uh, discussing uh, broadcasting in Scotland, or even anything Scottish, as it turns out. Anyway, we couldn't be better, uh, better set for today because we have uh, the speaker of speakers, really. Uh, we have the First Minister, Alex Hammond. So I'd like you to give him uh, a warm round of applause, uh, Alex Hammond. Thanks very much, Steve, and uh, for that uh, uh, introduction. Uh, I understand this session is sponsored by Come and Shoot in Canada. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted that the, uh, the television festival is uh, making one of the points I'm going to make in this speech for me. So, <laughs> and I'd like to extend a warm welcome to, to all of you. I mean, Edinburgh in the, in the festival period is a, a totally fantastic place to be. Uh, and I'm delighted that so many people from the, the television industry, from these islands overseas, uh, are here for the, the festival once again. Now, those of you who took the, the time off, and I hope it was most of you, to, uh, to go to the Channel 4 drinks reception in the, the National Museum of Scotland last night, uh, if you looked around the, <coughs> the exhibits on the, the ground floor, you'd see the, the world's first colour television. Uh, it's there in, in Edinburgh because it was uh, invented by John Logie Baird in 1928. Uh, and it took something like uh, 40 years. Uh, to go from invention to application of uh, colour television across the UK, uh, which is quite remarkable when you think of it, if you think about the change in human experience between 1928 and uh, 1969. <clears throat> but I'm going to argue today that that kind of symbolises the glacial pace uh, of adaption of broadcasting structures uh, in these islands to, to modern reality. And those of you who visit the BBC Scotland headquarters in Scotland at uh, at Pacific Quay in Glasgow, you could be shown the, the desk of, uh, of Lord Reef, the, the first Director General of the, the BBC, uh, at the BBC's original headquarters on Savoy Hill. It's in Glasgow, of course, because Reef, uh, like John Logie Baird, was a Scot. Uh, the two objects uh, in themselves are evidence of Scotland's contribution to the early development of television uh, and public service broadcasting in particular. Yet in 2012, this year, when the digital revolution gives every single one of us the, the choice of hundreds of channels. When Edinburgh this August is again, as it has been for decades, the, the world capital for a, a few weeks of uh, culture and communication, when people in Scotland are two, ways, two years away from the, the, the most important decision they're going to make for 300 years, uh, Scotland does not even have an English language public service broadcasting channel of its own. Now, when I was thinking about this speech, I started to think about how television portrays politicians around the world. Uh, in Denmark, uh, Borgen uh, portrays an ambitious female deputy who assumes high office and then governs ruthlessly. And I've been trying to explain to Nicola Sturgeon that this is just a, 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 a television show. <laughs> in, the, uh, in the United States of America, in the West Wing, a visionary, progressive leader, wrestles with matters of conscience in a smart and humane way. <laughs> and who says that television doesn't reflect reality? <laughs> uh, and in the United Kingdom, of course, uh, uh, the thick of it shows a, a Westminster government in permanent omni-shambles, which indicates that documentary television is alive and well in, uh, in these islands. Now, it does strike me, however, there isn't a, an equivalent Scottish version of any of these shows. Now, that could be, of course, because the 
unwavering competence to the Scottish Government does, isn't exciting enough for the, uh, the viewers, or alternatively it might be because there's no platform uh, for such a show to be broadcast. There is a, a shortage of Scottish content, <coughs> even on Scottish screens, uh, and never mind screens worldwide. And that's certainly not caused by a shortage of creative talent. Uh, nobody, plausibly, uh, could argue that at any time, and certainly you couldn't argue it uh, in Edinburgh, this festival city, uh, in August. Now, the cause lies uh, elsewhere, and that's what I want to explore uh, in this speech today. When Jeremy Hunt <coughs> launched the UK government's local media action plan in January last year, uh, I was struck by what he called the painful truth, which said that, quote, one of the most centralised media ecologies of any developed country exists in the UK. Uh, and that truth uh, resonates painfully here in Scotland, and of course it has a long history. The, the Scottish journalist, the former BBC journalist, Kenneth Roy, recently recounted in the, in the Scottish Review, uh, and I don't think he was being apocryphal, that in the 1970s, the controller of BBC, Scot BBC Scotland, if he wanted to buy an extra key for an unmanned studio in Dundee, he had to refer the decision to London first. <laughs> And famously, of course, in John Burke's memoirs, he revealed that in 1998 he enlisted the help of Tony Blair uh, to scupper plans for an integrated six o'clock news bulletin for Scottish viewers, uh, the so-called Scottish Six. And my goodness, uh, invading Iraq, stopping the Scottish Six was of no end to the great leader's talents. In 2007, shortly after I took office as First Minister, Ofcom published figures showing that in 2006, only 2.6% of the UK's network programming was commissioned from Scotland. In August of that year, I made a speech about broadcasting in the, in the National Museum of Scotland. In that speech, I announced the establishment of the, the Scottish Broadcasting Commission, a body which included members from across the political spectrum together with uh, industry experts. I argued that we have to transform the main framework for communications to become the, the truly ambitious and creative country we would all wish to be. We want to ensure the principle of editorial and creative control being exercised in Scotland on behalf of Scottish audiences. We want to create thriving production businesses taking Scottish talent onto the international stage and we want proper public service broadcasting for this exciting and energised country. Uh, the perspective, as you can see, was internationalist and uh, not just nationalist. In a world where digital technology allows great content to be shown and sold around the world more easily than ever before, the neglect of broadcasting policy in Scotland was not just shortchanging viewers here, it was undermining our ability to create programmes and formats with a worldwide resonance. In today's speech, I want to reflect on the development since 2007, and I want to make two main arguments. Uh, the first argument is that the Scottish Parliament since 2007 has already played a significant part in strengthening broadcasting in Scotland. The second is we need to have full responsibility for broadcasting policy. Only then will broadcasting be truly Scotland's window in the world, bringing us the best content from every country and allowing us to show the world what Scotland is capable of creating. Let's look first at the <coughs> gains that have been made since 2007. The Scottish Broadcasting Commission's final report, published in 2008, was endorsed by every single member of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, I can tell you that not every legislative proposal or proposal or commission that goes before the Scottish Parliament <laughs> receives unanimous endorsement. It highlighted in the report the declining levels of commissioning by UK television networks and concerns about the range and quality of the current radio and television services of Scotland. Its most important recommendation by far was the establishment of a new Scottish broadcaster, a Scottish digital network, which would provide and was aimed to provide public sector broadcasting plurality to the BBC. In the last four years, it should be said there has been a significant change for the better. The Scottish public sector is now much more active in developing and supporting the television production industry. Uh, for example, we have made major investment in skills. You've probably seen the stand here at this festival promoting TV production scheme uh, run by Scottish Enterprise jointly with Creative Scotland, and that boosts the production industry's export prospects. Public service broadcasters are working closely with Scottish production companies. The move of dramas such as Shed Media's Waterloo Road 
with investment in Scotland of over 25 million over the next two years will be hugely significant in sustaining a skills base of talent in Scotland, which will in itself encourage more home-based programming. There's already, of course, a, a range of talent among Scottish television production companies, from Raise the Roof of its Custy and Phil programmes to Hot Scotch's Story of Film for E4, from Terms New Commission Aberdeen Harbour to the Comedy Units Burniston. Companies operating in Scotland are producing a, a vast range of shows which appeal to, to Scottish, UK or global audiences. And uh, uh, I was noting uh, just the other day that uh, uh, the Antiques Road Trip uh, for uh, uh, several occasions over the last year has been the highest rated programme in BBC Two, and it's a programme, of course, produced by Scottish television. Uh, because of this, in 2011, Channel 4's investment in Scottish production that reached a, a record 14 million, the rise in BBC commission has been significant, from 3.5% in 2006 to 9% last year. And that increase alone is worth some £20 million to the Scottish economy. And the other successes are, are also worth uh, celebrating. The BBC Alapa, our national Gaelic language station, was launched in September 2008. And it's now been available in Scotland on Freeview for just over a year. Last month, more than 900,000 people watched it at their maximum. And that's a remarkable figure, ladies and gentlemen, since the Gaelic-speaking population of Scotland is just under 100,000. <laughs> Uh, now, admittedly, the uh, BBC Alapa's programme content it ranges far and wide, and it shows the only full-length Scottish football uh, on occasions. But nonetheless, it is extraordinary that a, a programming which broadcasts for six hours a day, a budget scarcely one-third the size of BBC Four's, uh, but last month it had a larger reach in Scotland. Whenever we have commissioned research or attitude to broadcasting, people have said that they want more Scottish content on television. Uh, BBC Alapa's audience figures show that this is not just what people say, uh, but what people do when the viewers have the opportunity to vote with the remote controls. Yet all of this uh, progress, that I've noted, welcome, overdue, does not meet the needs of Scotland in a digital age. At present, the limited scope for opt-out Scottish programmes in the UK television schedules is the result of a, a broadcasting framework put in place more than half a century ago. That framework has not been substantially altered despite the huge changes brought about by political devolution and digital broadcasting, all the other transformations in society and technology that we've all experienced. It means, for example, that despite Professor Anthony King's vigorous complaints about news coverage of the nations to the BBC Trust in 2008, that when Scottish viewers watch their main evening news bulletins, they frequently see headlines about issues which have no impact on their daily lives. A-level results, uh, dismantling of the, the health service in England. Indeed, if Danny Boyle wants to do a paying of praise to the National Health Service in a couple of years' time, he'll have to come to Scotland to do it. Maybe we'll ask him to do the opening ceremony of the Commonwealth Games, who knows? <laughs> and it means that out of more than 600 television channels and satellite, or 50 channels in Freeview, only one, the BBC Alapa, is devoted as a public service broadcaster to general interest Scottish programming. In an age of a digital revolution, broadcasting hasn't even adapted to devolution. The reason for that in my submission is that control over broadcasting has rested totally or almost completely with Westminster. For example, let's look at that <coughs> chief recommendation of the Scottish Broadcasting Commission, the establishment of the Scottish Digital Network. That recommendation was based on the need to ensure sustainable competition for the BBC for Scottish public service broadcasting content. It was also firmly based on the evidence that the Commission had taken from the viewers who demonstrated the appetite for more quality Scottish content. The idea of a Scottish digital network was explicitly, unanimously welcomed by the Scottish Parliament. The then cultural spokesman of the Conservative Party in Scotland went as far to say that the establishment of such a network was the settled will of the Scottish Parliament. And I put particular emphasis on that because in my immediate memory, that's the first time I've quoted the Conservative spokesman on anything <laughs> in the middle <coughs> of one of my speeches in support. Uh, but nonetheless, that's what the, was said and that's what was shared across the Parliament. However, successive UK government's key reports in Digital Britain and the local television did not even mention a proposal which had been the central aim 
of broadcasting policy adopted by the national parliament over the last four years. Alternatively, we could look for an example of how the television licence fee was decided two years ago. No one, out with the BBC Trust and the UK government, and not a great number of people within the UK government, knew the licence fee settlement was being agreed until after it happened. Yet it's self-evident that all of the nations of the UK had a strong interest in that settlement. As the House of Commons Cultural Media and Sport Committee pointed out, the whole process undermined confidence in both the BBC and indeed the UK government's commitment to accountability. The UK government is now planning a communications bill, which it believes will determine communications policy in this digital age. Uh, again, the Scottish government or the Welsh National Assembly or the Irish administration has no formal say in how that communication bill will affect our nations. All of this matters very much indeed. You're well aware, anybody in this audience, anybody at this festival, uh, of how important broadcasting is to a nation's creative economy, to its democracy, to its sense of being, to its sense of self. And despite the progress that I've noted over the last five years, the status quo is failing Scottish viewers. My view is that greater powers over broadcasting must be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. After all, the Scottish Parliament has protected free education to glorious success and the National Health Service in recent years uh, while enacting world-leading legislation on climate change. And it does seem to me if a parliament can successfully legislate on arguably the most important issue facing the entire planet, it's probably capable of taking responsibility for protecting and enhancing the values of public service broadcasting in this nation. The most secure way of ensuring a broadcasting framework that reflects the needs of the Scottish viewers is for Scotland to be an independent country. That way, all decisions about broadcasting in Scotland, in terms of the public service, will be taken by people who choose to live and work in Scotland. Broadcasting forms part of a, a wider vision for independent Scotland to be a fairer and more prosperous nation. We want to create high-value jobs in key sectors of the economy, such as the creative industries. We want to use the digital revolution to engage and include communities in Scotland who have been overlooked in conventional broadcasting. And we'll be publishing detailed proposals on independence, including for broadcasting, next year in the White Paper. But I thought it'd be helpful here to set out part of the, the framework. The first thing to, to make clear is, like any good liberal democracy, we would guarantee the independence of broadcasters. We'd also ensure the requirements for broadcasting impartiality are in place. The second point, is that we'd respect existing licenses. So if the Channel 3, 4, 5 licenses are renewed or extended prior to independence, and that seems likely, their terms would be respected by the Scottish Government. Indeed, I know that SDV and ITV, in discussing their network arrangements, have taken care to ensure that any such arrangements can continue after independence. We'd also establish a, a national public service broadcaster based on the existing staff and assets of BBC Scotland. Further details on how that broadcaster would operate and its continuing relationship with the BBC will be published next year. However, the basic principle that Scotland, as an independent nation, would have at least one national public service broadcaster is clear and should be totally unsurprising. In Denmark, for example, which is a population of five and a half million people, there are two public service broadcasters, TV2 and DR. For a total of eight nationwide channels, TV2 also runs eight regional uh, television stations. In Norway, if uh, a population of 5 million, the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation runs free public service channels together with a number of digital channels that are also free commercially run competitors. In both of these nations, the existing of, existence of a strong broadcasting sector provides a wide choice of public service programming, a real stimulus for the television production sector. In 2009, we published as a government a paper on opportunities for broadcasting. And some of the press coverage was uh, baffled by the fact that we used Denmark as an example. I suppose now that programmes such as The Killing and Borgen are both fantastic examples of how quickly good quality shows can become international successes, uh, there would be less surprise uh, in losing that example today. Ireland provides a, a further example of the potential economic benefits of a stronger broadcasting sector. In 2009, a, a total of £92 million pounds of television production took place in Scotland. In 2009, in Ireland, which was then reeling from the international financial crisis, 
Television production by the independent sector alone was twice as large, at almost £200 million sterling. With independence, news and current affairs provision would cater effectively for viewers in Scotland. There would be more opportunities to show Scottish comedy, culture, documentary, sports, drama. We would be able to design a framework which meets the needs of specific communities whether in the south of Scotland or in the Shetland Islands. And crucially, we would continue to provide open access for broadcasters from the rest of the UK and elsewhere who wish to provide entertainment and information to Scottish viewers. Economically, a uh, dynamic broadcasting sector links with other creative industries. For example, our film sector, our world-class video game sector, our theatre companies. One of the uh, great frustrations uh, I have with the otherwise magnificent festivals here in our capital city <coughs> is how few of the productions or the programmes that showcased here the wealth of culture on display here, uh, how few of them go on uh, to uh, uh, television or indeed film production. Now we do our best to, to counter that with the Expo Fund, which ensures that the best of Scottish culture can be shown at festivals around the world. But there's no substitute for television broadcasts or film production of these great creative events. An independent Scotland will be able to use fiscal policy to attract additional production. Large media centres such as London's exert a, a huge centrifugal force. The existence of a national broadcaster for Scotland would help counter that in itself, but fiscal incentives might well be needed to attract more television and film production in Scotland. That point is uh, especially important in a digital world, where online content means that location and access to the spectrum will be increasingly less important. We should be targeting areas where Scotland excels and make sure that specific production, indeed channels, are based in Scotland. Now we cannot foresee all of the opportunities that will arise in the next decade or, or 20 years, but with independence we certainly would be better placed to seize these opportunities and to meet the challenges as and when they arrive. Most importantly of all, we no longer have a situation where urgent broadcasting policy issues for Scotland are passed over by a Westminster government, which lacking the inclination or the motivation or even the time to see them as priorities. That has been the fa fate of, uh, in my submission, of the broadcasting sector in Scotland since the 1920s, uh, when Lord Reef and John Logie Baird were in their prime. Uh, I don't think it should be allowed to continue anymore. We should no longer be prepared to live in a world where it takes 40 years to innovate from invention to application, uh, where we accept legislative frameworks which are 50 years out of date. For many European or international perspective, it is inexplicable uh, that a country like Scotland, with its distinctive continuous history and identity, should not even have one dedicated mainstream English-speaking television channel. Uh, from a Scottish perspective, <coughs> which had once looked like a, an odd omission in our broadcasting system, now looks more like a glaring gap in a media landscape. Regardless of views on Scotland's constitutional future, Scotland needs a broadcasting framework for, uh, which is adapted to the digital age, which helps our creative industries, which meets the needs and requirements of viewers in Scotland. Independence gives us the, the best possible chance of creating that framework. But by doing so, it will ensure that broadcasting in Scotland fulfills some fundamental requirements. It will boost our economy, it will enrich our culture, it will strengthen our democracy, and it will provide Scotland's window in the world and the world's window in Scotland. Thank you very much indeed.